everyone in today's video we're going to talk about the basic pathophysiology or pathogenesis with respect to fetal growth restriction the guidelines or the points in this video are based on the newest ISUOG guidelines and the pathophysiology is from James textbook of high-risk pregnancy now coming to the basic definition or differences between small for gestational age and fetal growth restriction in small for gestational age the values that is the AC or the effective fetal weight will be less than 10th percentile for that specific gestational age. It might be physiological or pathological. Whereas in FGR, the baby has failed to reach its predetermined growth potential. It means there is some underlying pathology which is not allowing the fetus to grow to, which, to its original potential and hence it's always pathological. Coming to what are the factors which are influencing fetal growth you can always divide fetal growth or the factors which are affecting fetal growth into fetal factors placental factors and uterine factors and maternal factors in the fetal factor the main pathology is with the fetus the anomalies or the cardiac diseases or chromosomal abnormalities are not allowing the baby to reach the appropriate growth Whereas the maternal factors, the uterine and the placental factors all have a very common problem. That is, they are not allowing the substrate, that is the oxygen or the glucose or any other energy sources to reach the fetus and hence they are not allowing the cells to undergo hyperplasia or hypertrophy depending on the fetal gestational age. For example, if you consider cardiorespiratory diseases, renal diseases, drugs, smoking, alcohol in the mother, they are not allowing the transfer of the substrate to the fetus. That is, they cause some amount of uteroplacental insufficiency and chronic hypoxia in the mother. In the uterine factors, which are described here, like connective tissue disorders, chronic hypertension, preeclampsia, all of them have some amount of endothelial dysfunction. And whenever there is endothelial dysfunction, it means there is some amount of oxidative stress which is released, which is causing some amount of vasospasm. In the initial phases, this vasospasm is very localized and focal, whereas if it persists, the oxidative stress and endothelial damage becomes widespread and hence causes profound fetal hypoxia. In the placental factors also, there are microthrombi which are formed, which are affecting the fetal growth and hence not allowing the baby to grow up to its genetic potential. All the causes or the points which are mentioned in this chart can be summarized as follows. There is, that is, either there is a substrate deficiency, that is the baby is not receiving enough oxygen and other nutrients, or there are microthrombi in the placental site which are not allowing diffusion or transfusion of the substrate, there is defective transport, placental dysfunction, inadequate angiogenesis which is not allowing enough transfer and most importantly there might be incomplete trophoblastic invasion which is the main pathogenesis in preeclampsia. What happens when so many features are present at once? In the end because the substrate by one means or the other is not getting transferred to the fetus there is hypoglycemia and this hypoglycemia triggers metabolic uh, metabolic processes which lead to utilization of other uh, substrates like proteins and fats as a means of energy source for the fetus and hence because there is anaerobic respiration triggered in the absence of oxygen there will be increased amount of lactates in the fetus there is gluconeogenesis occurring from proteins amino acids are consumed chronic hypoxia sets in all of this leads to fetal acidosis and fetal ketosis and in the end it causes significant down regulation of the growth axis which leads to the fetus being a, fet uh, a growth retarded baby. Now what happens despite all the pathophysiology that is happening? When it's mild amount of placental dysregulation which is there, the baby compensates for its hypoxia and hypoglycemia. So, initially the cardiac output increases so that the hypoxia is combated. But still the left to right shunt which is there in the fetal heart that is due to the presence of ASD, it's still maintained, that left to right shunt is maintained. The peripheral vessels start constricting so that all the blood which is there or the available oxygen which is there goes to more important visceral organs like the fetal brain, spleen, liver, 
so that the major organ systems are protected and hence fetal cerebral vasodilatation is seen as an important parameter which is depicted in the MCA Doppler in which the MCA PSV increases. Okay? Whereas the peripheral vessels constriction and increased truncal resistance on Doppler can be seen as increased resistance in the peripheral arteries. For example, increased, pe increased PI in the umbilical artery is an important feature seen in the Doppler as an early change. When all of this hypoxia, hypoxemia and some amount of acidemia sets in and it stays for a longer duration, organ systems start, the maturation of the organ system start getting delayed and hence the control of central nervous system of the fetus on the CVS, which is controlling the FHS, the baseline FHS, the variability both short term and long term are affected. There is decreased fetal activity and when chronic hypoxia sets in, the baseline FSH goes on a higher level. Okay, and there is decreased variability on NST. Both short term variability and long term variability are affected. When the chronic hypoxia sets in, it also stimulates erythropoietin synthesis because the body just wants to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of the already existing blood volume. So, erythropoietin synthesis increases, but that is not enough because only erythropoietin, when it's increasing, it causes significant polycythemia, which can trigger thrombosis in the fetal circulation. And there's a lot of erythroid precursors which are there in the fetal circulation. And because of the oxidative stress which is developing because of endothelial damage, there is increased platelet aggregation in the fetus leading to fetal thrombocytopenia. Chronic hypoxia starts affecting the kidneys, leading the fetal kidneys leading to a kind of renal injury which causes oligohydromnios in a, in a long term duration. Also, long standing Hypoxia leads to reduced fetal tone, breathing movements and short term and long term variability on the NST are reduced. So, all of these constitute the modified biophysical profile or the biophysical profile. So, all components of the biophysical profile start getting affected once the hypoxia is chronic. In the end, because the baby's organ systems, especially the cardia is not able to compensate for the hypoxia, the increased truncal resistance goes on increasing, increasing that leads to the left to right shunt becoming a right to left shunt which is depicted as raised right atrial pressure leading to preload being increased and the baby not able to compensate for it. It goes into cardiac failure and ultimately leads to fetal death. So that is it in this video, basic pointers on the pathophysiology of FGR. Hope it was useful. Thank you for watching.